In our last video on Android app quality, we took a look at visual design and user interaction and functionality. In this video, we're going to look at performance and stability uh, and uh, Google Play and test procedures. So first of all, uh, functionality. Uh, I'm sorry, we already did cover functionality. Yes, performance and stability. App does not crash, force close, freeze, or otherwise function abnormally on any targeted device. What this means is what it says. The app should not close unexpectedly. What often happens is that we will have a long running process such as a network operation that happens on what's called the user interface thread. That's actually banned as of Android 4 and greater. Uh, so that's not so common anymore, but sometimes if you have heavy computations uh, that are happening in, uh, in a limited, it's hard to explain without knowing threading, but if you have a lot of things going on in one thread or one process, it can freeze up the application, particularly if that thread is a UI thread. Okay, I'll have examples of stability and performance in just a moment. App loads quickly or provides on-screen feedback to the user if the app takes longer than two seconds to load. With strict mode enabled, no red flashes, performance warnings, are visible when exercising the app, including during the gameplay, animation, and UI transitions, and any other parts of the app. What I'm going to show you here for performance is a discussion on threading. So threading means we can kind of virtualize what's going on in the app and have it do multiple things at once. Uh, so we can take long running processes and keep them off to the side and the user interface can still be responsive and that's important. If the user interface is not responsive, the user is going to keep clicking on something thinking that they didn't click enough and that a lot of times is what gives you an application not responding or an ANR warning uh, if you're using an app. So uh, now I will say I'm using the emulator here, and the emulator is much slower than the app is in real life. But what's going to happen is I'm going to click this picture as soon as it recognizes my click. And if you saw, there was a little break there. If you noticed, when I clicked the picture, initially the user interface came back. And then about a few seconds after that, or maybe even milliseconds, it populated these colors. That's because this is two different threads working. One of them is drawing the UI and responding to user events. The other one is interrogating this picture for colors and finding the top 16 colors. So again, if I click, you'll see there will be a little difference between when the screen loads and when the colors are available. It's more noticeable on the emulator just because the emulator is a little bit slower than the actual app. Uh, but you will see a bit of a difference. And oh, there we go. Okay, that time it, it might have cached him because that time it came up pretty quickly. Now watch this. I'm going to click on one of these colors, like this one down here. And what's going to happen is it is going to show me a list of results. But again, it's going to do this in several threads. It's going to first start to draw a screen, and the user interface will be interactive. Then it's going to show me a list of plants that have that color, and the UI is going to remain interactive with the user. It's going to put placeholders where pictures will eventually go. And then it's going to fill in those placeholders with actual pictures uh, of the plan. Okay, so uh, those are going to be three steps you'll see on an actual device. It would take uh, about three seconds to complete that entire sequence. On this, it's going to take much longer just because it's an emulator. But this is done with threading. And the most important part is that the UI remains responsive to the user. So the user doesn't think that the app has crashed. So I'm going to click, and I said it will take a few seconds. Okay, blank screen, but we can still click it. Then we'll get a list of results. Um, and I said in the real app, this would it would already be done by now. Okay, got the results in the placeholder. Notice I can still scroll, even though the images haven't loaded. It's just put the stylized P in there, but it's given me a list of images. What it's doing now in a separate thread or in a separate process is it's going out and getting the images. And again, on a live device, it would have been done by now. You see, now it's just starting to load the images. On the uh, emulator, it takes a little bit more time. As a matter of fact, I have a feeling that the images have actually loaded because it pulled that one up. Um, and I think that the UI on the emulator simply hasn't refreshed. But yeah, on, the, on an actual device, you would see these would have uh, been populated by now. We'll go ahead and click that again. 
I'll keep talking uh, through some other, uh, through a couple other guidelines, but that's what we call threading. That's what we call multi-threading. So uh, the trick there is those images, and you see we have little loading images pop up. Those images are pretty big files, so we want to download them in a separate thread. If we didn't, the UI would be completely locked up at this point. I'm going to go ahead and move that off to the side and let it uh, do its image loading. And while it's doing that, we're going to continue to talk through uh, some more quality guidelines. Okay. Uh, music and video pay playback is smooth without crackle, stutter, or other artifacts during the normal app usage and load. App displays graphics, text, images, and other UI elements without notable, noticeable distortion, blurring, or pixelation. When I wrote the mobile app, uh, you know, I, as with most mobile apps, I designed it for a phone where that image would look just about right on a phone, that little stylized P there. When I did a stylized P for the Play Store, you see it had to be a much higher resolution image. So one thing that they require is that we make an image that is the proper resolution for each platform. Each platform, what does that mean? Well, we could deploy on a mobile device, we could deploy on a tablet, we could deploy on a television, a watch. So we need to make sure that our we have a different icon for each of those. Uh, if we look under the covers at how an Android program works, what we'll typically see is there will be a res, and then you'll see drawable HDPI, drawable LDPI, and drawable MDPI. And there are a couple others now. There's like an XHDPI. Uh, if we look at uh, Favico under HDPI, what we'll take a look is there's the stylized P for HDPI. Okay, now we'll go to LDPI, and I'm going to click on the same icon again. And you see there it is, uh, as soon as I drag it over here, there it is much smaller. So it's an image that has been drawn and scaled for that correct dimension. And the one on the Play Store is the biggest of all. You see how it's very smooth around the edges? It doesn't look like an image that's just been stretched and is very pixelated. So uh, be good with image editing. We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the semester as well. Okay, app displays text and text blocks in an acceptable manner. Uh, so don't cut off letters, you know, don't cut off words, so on and so forth. By the way, as I've been talking, you'll see in the background it did actually load each of those images that have a color similar to the one uh, that we took. So there we go, lots of images like that. Okay, um, all right, on to Google Play. App strictly adheres to the terms of the Google Play developer uh, content policy and does not offer inappropriate content, does not use intellectual property, or brand of others and so on. That kind of goes without saying. App maturity level is set appropriately based on the content rating guidelines. Especially note that the app requests permission to use the device location, uh, that apps that request permission to use device location cannot be given the maturity level everyone. That's an interesting thing. Uh, most of our apps are going to, or a lot of them, not most of them, but a lot of them are going to use uh, some kind of location-based setting. So if we take a look at the search screen, we're going to see search for plant and one of the options we have is native. Now native, uh, this I didn't know until I got into plants. Native is, is a geographical term. So around Cincinnati, let's see if I do native and edible, this is a very popular search. What, uh, what plants are native and have edible parts in Cincinnati? If I do native and edible, it's going to show plants that were initially discovered in this area. But plants that were initially discovered in this area are typically different from plants that would have been discovered uh, in China or in Asia or something like that. So native depends on your geography. So this screen here, the search plant screen, shows you, and here we go, Paul Paul, the one I was talking about a little bit earlier, uh, service theory, lots of good options here. That search screen uses GPS to determine things like, where are you? Uh, what is native to where you are? What is the bloom time from where you are? Because things like bloom times can change also. So uh, it needs GPS to make that search smarter. I also talked about the Titan TV app that's going to use GPS to try to figure out what TV stations are near you. So that's one you'll commonly use. But because you're doing location tracking, 
uh, it can't be for everyone. It has to at least be set to low maturity. Okay. Um, app features graphics that follow the design guidelines outlined in this blog post, which I believe I pulled up here. Uh, okay, so some icon guidelines. This will have, we'll have an exercise that goes over this a little bit later in the semester when we kind of storyboard our first app. We're going to want to make some icons for it as well. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the semester. App screenshots and videos do not show or reference non-Android devices. Now there is an Apple uh, app guideline that's almost identical to this, but reverse. It says that any screenshots uh, cannot show anything that's not an Apple device, which makes sense. So what they don't want someone to do is to make a device that's uh, make an app for a competing OS and then show a how-to that uh, only shows the competing OS, not the Android OS in the Android's case or not the Apple OS in Apple's case. Okay, uh, screenshots do not, represent, do not misrepresent the content and experience of your app in a misleading way. Again, easy enough. Common user reported bugs in the review tab of the Google Play page are addressed if they are reproducible and occur on many different devices. If a bug only occurs on a few devices, you should still address it if those devices are popular or, or new. So on the app listing page that I will see, uh, there's a place where you can submit a bug and it will come right to me. This is the consumer's version of the Google Play Store, but if I go to the uh, Google Play developer console, it'll show me my view as a publisher. This is a page I check very frequently. And one thing it will show me is I can look at any bugs that have been submitted. Now, let's see, mine's at 521 downloads. That's, that's, a, that's a good number. It kind of takes you up into a good bracket, but... Anyway, um, honestly, I've only had one bug submitted, and it was submitted, uh, crashes and ANRs, here we go. It was submitted by my wife uh, when she was testing it. So that was pretty, you know, uh, that was pretty nice because there was a bug that I released in the application. I didn't see it when I was testing it, but my wife did, so she was able to report it to me. And from there, I was very quickly able to fix it. What's funny is that I had actually released the app as uh, let me go to my app version here i released the app with the bug is that version four and i very quickly released a newer version called five and so you see nobody has four installed anymore which is good so that means that that one that was only released for 24 hours until my wife reported the bug uh, nobody actually has it i'm currently on version seven but um once I uh, once the heaviness of the semester and grading passes, I'm I hopefully will have a version eight coming out pretty soon that addresses a few more things that uh, I want to take care of. Okay, um, test procedures. This a lot of these it it feels like your uh, a lot of these test procedures here feel obvious, but trust me, if you are going to release an app, it's a good idea to walk through each of these. Uh, because I did, and I found a lot of bugs I did not know about. about. Okay, uh, first one, navigate to all parts of the app, all screens, dialogue, setting, and user flow. If the application allows for editing, gameplay, or media, make sure to enter those flows, create, modify content. Uh, when exercising the app, introduce transient changes in network connectivity, battery function, uh, GPS, or location availability, system load, and so on. That is something I have baked into the Android app is online offline toggle happens automatically without the user even knowing about it. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go to this thing called uh, plant service. And again, this class does not talk about code. So I don't expect you to know what this code is, but I can read it to you and you can probably get a pretty good idea what's going on. Here's where somebody will search for plants. What's going to happen is at first, it is going to, um, at first it's going to go online, which means it's going to go directly to plantplaces.com. Uh, so in other words, if I go to plantplaces.com, uh, here's the search for Redbud. It goes to this URL, and it's going to return this search for Redbud, or Control u shows it in a slightly more uh, structured format. If I change that to maple, okay, you see it's going to show me all the maples. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to try to search online. But if something goes wrong, it's going to come to this catch. 
in the catch here, this is only going to happen if something goes wrong. By the way, it'll be skipped if everything goes fine. What's going to happen in the catch is it's going to fail over and it is going to search a local copy of data for the, that same plan. Now, the next thing it's going to do, if it was online, if it did execute online, it's going to go to this cache plants routine. And what that does is that takes the plants it found online and saves them locally. So in other words, when you search for a plant, it's going to be saved locally on your phone so that in case you have a network outage later, uh, it will have a local copy of that plant. I've used this quite a bit uh, myself, and the user won't even notice the difference. But if we look at the uh, website, Plant GPS, uh, what you'll see is I've GPSed a lot of places not in the United States. So, for example, uh, Birmingham, UK Botanical Gardens. This is a garden um, right around the middle of England, so about uh, probably two hours outside of London, maybe two and a half hours outside of London. But I GPSed a lot of plants here, and this is a time when I had no network coverage. So what I could do is the GPS is always available, uh, but I wanted to make it so I didn't have to do a lot of manual entry. So I had all the plants already on my phone. When I would go up to a plant, I just had to select it and then associate my current GPS position with that plant. And then as soon as I got back to my hotel, I was able to go ahead and synchronize all the plants with plantplaces.com. So that's a good case where you're able to use an app online or offline. And like I talked in a previous video, uh, the TripAdvisor apps are a good demonstration of that as well. So the ability to go online, offline without the user even knowing. Okay, from each screen, press the home key, then relaunch the app from the all apps screen. From each app screen, switch to another running app and then return to the app under test using the recent app switcher. From each app screen, press the back button. From each app screen, rotate the device between landscape and portrait. Uh, switch to another app to send a test app to the background. Go to settings and check whether the test app has any services running while in the background. Uh, in Android 401 and higher, go to the app screen and find the app in the running tab. In earlier versions, versions use manage applications. So make sure you're not consuming too much battery or uh, or bandwidth by running a service in the background when your app should be in the background as well. Press the power button to put the device to sleep. Press it again to awaken. Uh, set the device to lock when the power button is pressed. Press the power button to put the device to sleep. Uh, and then, uh, then unlock the device. For devices that have slide out keyboards, slide the keyboard in and out at least once. For devices that have keyboard docks, attach the device to the keyboard dock. So this is one thing I always recommend, which is uh, save your old phone. You can use it as a testing device. It's oftentimes a very good idea. For devices that have external display port, plug in the external display. Didn't even know those existed. Trigger and observe in the notification drawer all of the notifications that the app can display. Expand notifications where applicable and tap all actions offered. Examine the permissions requested by the app going to settings app info or we just showed how to do that uh, uh, also in the, in the Play Store. That's what the user will see what's in the Play Store. Repeat core suite with the app installed to the SD card. Okay, move to the SD card, try again. Uh, try repeat core sweep with hardware uh, acceleration enabled. Okay. A repeat core sweep with strict mode profiling enabled as described below. And that's something I haven't tried yet. So there's a strict mode um, to see what things you're doing heavily on the uh, main thread. Remember I was talking about threading and how it showed our list of results with images, little thumbnails that came up in a different thread. So the strict mode will tell you, are you doing too much heavy lifting in that UI thread? Okay, um, sign into the developer console to review your developer profile, app description, screenshots, feature graphic, maturity setting, and user feedback. I do that very frequently. I look at, the, um, I look at this store listing very frequently. Uh, the only thing is, I know I have a new release coming out, and I know that's going to fix a lot of usability issues. So I'm kind of nervous to look at it now, to be perfectly honest with you. But because, uh, you know, it, there's nothing worse than knowing you have a bug or maybe something that could be designed better. And then someone comments on it and you have something that's, you know, just a few weeks away from going live. 
Download your feature graphic and screenshots and scale them down to match the display sizes on the device and the form factors you are targeting. Review all graphical assets, media, text, code, libraries, and other content packaged in the app or expansion file download. Okay, navigate to all screens of your app and enter all in-app purchase flows. This one here, GP3, that's another one It seems obvious. Don't put too much in your app, but not so obvious. When I made this live, I found I had a whole lot of stuff I had done that I wasn't even using. And so I went through and ripped it all out and retested. So that's something you want to pay a lot of attention to. Don't leave uh, orphan code in your app if it's not being used. Don't leave any orphan images. Make sure that everything in your app is only what your app needs. Okay, make sure there's nothing extra there. Because the more stuff you have that's not being used, uh, the more maintenance you have to do. So that wraps up, wraps up the Android quality guidelines. Uh, we're also going to have some videos that talk about how to deploy. Uh, and again, if you want to see the Apple version of these, uh, they're very similar. Uh, they're more about the review guidelines, but those are available as well. So uh, take a look uh, with this information then. Work on your uh, program, your not programming assignment, your quality and usability assignment, and I look forward to seeing what you have. Thank you.